Christmas night. Um, okay, so um, if you don't know me, my name is Jacob Chapman. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to talk here today. Um, so I'm working on a collaborative project during my PhD between University College London and the National Physical Laboratory. Um, so the, uh, most of my talk I'm going to be talking about this, the switching dynamics and mechanisms in morphotropic um, PZT, which is um, lead zircon and titanate. Um, so I use atom stick models in this. And I'll also look a little bit at aging um, in lead titanate as well towards the end. Okay, so um, most of you probably won't know about NPL. So NPL is our National Physical Laboratory and it's our Centre for Metrology. Um, so they basically have a look at measurement standards and try to get um, uh, disseminate research between government, academia and industry. Um, so one of the things that we look at, they do quite a wide range of things, but I'm part of the, the Mathematic Modeling and Simulation Group. Um, so they do everything from continuum modeling to uh, data analysis. But what I look at is this atomistic modeling, like I said. Um, so usually I look at um, first and second principle, principles atomistic um, approaches for density functional theory and classical molecular dynamics. Um, so we look at a wide range of things because ferroelectrics can be implemented in um, a lot of devices. And I kind of um, highlighted this aerospace um, section here because it kind of highlights the temperature range at which these devices can be used. Um, so if you take um, ferroelectrics, they can be used on the um, leading edge of a wind to control the roughness, to control the, um, the, the boundary airflow. Um, they're used in spacecraft to control the jitter to stop sensitive um, components getting damaged during liftoff. Um, and they've even been proposed to be like um, radiation hard um, sensors and things like tokamaks and sterilators. So they act from down to close to zero Kelvin all the way up to really high temperatures. So we need to be able to understand um, these materials across a whole wide range of temperatures, so that's what I'm going to be looking at. Um, so first I'll talk about the models. Like I said, in, in this work I'm um, using an atomistic model using classical molecular dynamics. Um, so in this case we have our atoms and they're, they're time evolved using the uh, Newtonian equations of motion. Um, but obviously in ferroelectrics, polarizability of atoms is quite important. So if we have a rigid atom, that's not particularly useful. So we use the adiabatic core shell model. In this case, we treat uh, um, each atom in two parts. We have a, a massive nucleus and a light shell, which are tethered by a spring. This way, when you apply an electric field, it can be displaced and you have a dipole moment. Um, so we control our interatomic forces by um, the gradient of the buffering potentials here, where the parameters have been fitted to um, density functional theory using the root current um, exchange correlation function. Um, so when we set up our system, we put on all our atoms and we start to time evolving up. Eventually we've equilibrated it, and we can start gathering statistics. So in ferroelectrics, one of the most important we want to look at is polarization, which we calculate using um, a titanium sensor conventional unit cell uh, using secretion here. Okay, so I'm looking at PZT, so in our model it's been fitted and it reproduces the, the full compositional um, phase diagram really well. So for uh, lead zirconate, we get anti-ferroelectric um, phase, so this is macroscopically non-polar but locally polar. Um, as you start to introduce titanium content, it's one of the equals the polarization points towards the core, and the, um, the shells are on the 1 1 1 directions. In the um, lead, tita um, lead titanate and lead rich uh, region, it's a tetragonal phase. And then this region of interest here, where you get um, extremely large electrical mechanical effects, um, is a monoclinic phase. And of course, at high temperatures, we get this um, transition to a non parallel cubic phase across the full composition. Um, so in comparison to experiment, our, result, uh, our model works quite well. We get this um, NPV region, we get, this, um, we get the full um, spectrum. So this is quite useful. Um, and we've also compared the um, domain wall energies with um, density functional theory. So here it was using PVE sol um, in CP2K. And we try in particular to calculate domain wall energies using um, molecular dynamics and compare those to density functional um, theory results. We get extremely good, um, extremely comparable results. So we're happy our force field works quite well at producing physical properties. Um, so like I said, low temperatures. Um, this hasn't been particularly well characterized for the morphotropic phase boundary, so um, this is one of the things we started looking at. So we found quite an interesting report by NASA where they found that the coercive field would drop off at about 200 Kelvin, um, and at about 300 Kelvin, the um, saturation polarization uh, Polarization, um, polarization start to drop up gradually, going pretty much to zero. 
And but when we did our model in this, we found that actually the coercive field would keep increasing and it would have its maximum zero Kelvin. Um, so we wondered what the discrepancy was, but our experimental um, collaborators repeated the experiment and found the same thing, where um, at about below 200 Kelvin, um, the hysteresis became extremely narrow and the care started looking like lost without effort. That was using one experimental setup. They then re um, used a different experimental setup, but they could apply a larger um, applied voltage, and they found that you would actually get the hysteresis. So this is quite an important point. If you get the coercive field to drop off, it could be that the applied voltage is too small to overcome the coercive field. Um, so there's quite a lot of people that's been done in switching models um, over the past 30, 40 years. One of the most well established is the KAI, KAI model. Um, so using our force fields, so this is for 50-50, um, we um, fit it into the data and we find that our profile of the curves um, matches that pretty well. We get a dimensionality of between two and three, depending on the composition of what we forward pole gone on. Um, so something that's been quite interesting that's come up in the past few years is there's um, something called the creep to pinning transition. So this is even in the absence of um, defects, you'll find a, um, a creep region. And this is actually an intrinsic effect, and they argue, uh, it's, I think it's the Andrew Rapps group, um, that this is due to the, the rate limiting effect of the nucleation. So you've got this large critical nucleus, um, and you've got these small fluctuations, so it's the nucleation that's actually the rate limiting effect. So you get this creep here. So one of the things we wanted to ask ourselves is, if you get rid of all the domain walls, so you've got a single domain, um, do you still get a temperature dependence? Um, so what we did is we set up our system, so we pre poled during the equilibration, um, and then during the production, we apply a switching filter. So we've used a relatively large system using um, 20 by 20 by 20 atoms, um, unit cells, which is about 4,000 atoms. Um, we use a DL poly package to use a, a time evolution, and we use a constant stress MST ensemble. Okay, so we do find that there is, in fact, this crossover kinetic mechanism. So if we look at low temperatures, we find that um, you get this rotational flavor in the um, polarization. So you get these activated X and Y components, whereas at room temperature, you find that the switching only occurs via the Z, and macroscopically there's no X and Y. So we wanted to look into this a bit more detail. Um, and what we find is that at room temperature, the critical nucleus is quite small, and the fluctuations are quite large in comparison to the switching barrier. So you get these small, fast-switching nuclei which kind of coalesce, but you don't really have much long-range order. Um, what's quite interesting is that low temperature, um, well, so here's a picture of our um, small domains, where as you can see that you've got a much larger domain at low temperature. Um, so at 100 Kelvin, we looked at this in a bit more detail. Um, so on the left here, these are um, snapshots at certain uh, particular moments in time. Um, and what I do is, if the polarization is positive, I don't plot anything. If polarization is negative, I plot a cube um, whose color is dependent on its local structure. Um, so when it's all polarized up, see nothing, you get this white, or represented in cartoon by blue. Um, and when it starts whole, um, polarized negative, we start seeing these cubes appear. So you do get these nucleation events where the critical nucleus is too small. Um, but eventually you start getting these nucleation events here, um, which are above a certain critical radius and start to grow. Um, so what I say about these is they typically, um, obviously they form statistically, but typically we find the ones that stabilize have kind of an octahedral type shape. Um, so this is kind of like a three-dimensional equivalent of what was found um, in this paper here where you get these beveled um, domain walls, um, beveled nucleation sites on um, 2D domain walls. Um, so that's quite good. And what we find is that um, on this kind of um, uh, nucleus, you kind of get um, you get some domain walls which are less energetically favorable than others. So if you take these two here, you see the charge, so you've got a, at this point here, a tail to tail domain, and here you've got a head to head. So they're energetically unfavorable, so that stimulates growth in these directions, which is exactly what we find. So eventually we can't start seeing these like a kind of 90 degree-ish flavor domains. These are locally orthorhombic, and this is a locally um, tetragonal. Um, and eventually you start having this, which then grows in a conventional manner, and then as these domain walls start to merge, it then flips around to being able to progress. So one of the things that we next looked at is we used um, a method of looking at the density of probability um, for the two different systems. Um, so what this essentially is, is a histogram at each point of all good time. Um, so this is the polarization of each of the components, and the thick black line is the macroscopic polarization, um, or the average polarization. 
and the dotted lines are one standard deviation from the mean. So if we look at the 100 Kelvin um, results, we see that we, during the switching up here, so this is where it finally switches, we see that there's a large, um, uh, large distribution or significant band softening. What's even more important or interesting is the fact that you find there's a species dependent. Um, so you find the titanium um, centered unit cells soften more, so these have a higher degree of um, softening. If we look at 300 Kelvin results, we see that here is quite symmetric, but we still get these um, band softening events, so there's still some underlying um, remnants of this other mechanism that exists. Um, so this is kind of similar now. What I'm looking at is um, I'm looking at the B cation ferroelectric displacements. Um, and again, we see that it's very comparable to the polarization, however, you get a much wider distribution, but the profiles of the curves follow quite well. In fact, if I compare them, here, so this is um, the ferroelectric displacements of um, B along X, and this is the PX. We compare the profiles of the curve, we see they're extremely similar. So this is encouraging, because this is what we expect to see. We do know there are some slight differences, and this is because you get contributions to the polarization from the octahedral cage, which isn't included um, here in the ferroelectric displacement. Um, so now what we want to look at, like we noted before, those standard deviations, there are some species dependent between the zirconium and the titanium centered unit cells. So when we look at this, we see there's quite a big difference. This is 100 Kelvin. For the titanium centered, you note that in for the X and Y components, it's pretty much symmetric, so there's no contribution to the, um, those X and Y components. And these actually come from the zirconium, so it's the zirconium which are rotating, whereas the titanium centered unit cells are going through, the, um, through gamma. Um, then what's particularly interesting is what happens here for the, um, the Z component, the polarization for the titanium centered unit cells. We see that our curve actually has a double peak. So this is particularly interesting, particularly since it looks like there is a subset of our titanium um, unit cells which could be um, a dead region because they're not, they've got no ferroelectric um, displacements. So we wanted to look at this in more detail. Um, so we see that same double peak in our polarization um, probability um, density. Um, so what we did is we did a neighbor analysis. You know, you'd expect a, a gamma, um, just, uh, like a Gaussian distribution here, but we actually get this double peak. And what we find is it actually fits um, two, gamma, um, two Gaussian curves here. One from where you've got predominantly zirconium neighbors, and one where you've got predominantly titanium neighbors. So what we find, is that titanium, which have more zirconium neighbors, have suppressed ferroelectric displacements. Those which have more titanium neighbors have the larger ferroelectric displacement, which is why you get the splitting in the curve. So this is useful, or this is particularly important, if you experimentalist and you can't see your oxygen too well, you might have a look at your ferroelectric displacements and assume that you've got a dead region because you know, you've got the um, ferroelectric displacements there, but you're actually getting um, polarization contributions from the oxygen. Um, so the next thing we wanted to look at was the local structure. So during switching, what we do is we use um, this technique here. We take the polarization, if it's below a certain limit, we assume that um, the local units are the cubic. Um, if the um, polarization is above this, or if any component polarization is above this limit divided by root 6, we say that component is And depending on the number of polarization components, this means whether it um, dictates the um, the structure. So this was first introduced by this paper here. Um, so what we find is that during the switching, it goes from being tetragonal, and then we get that um, growth, that nucleated domain, domain growth, which is largely orthorhombic. But then, right as it switches, we get a, an increase in um, rhombohedral um, unit cells. And then after it switch, it goes back to being tetragonal. Um, and then again, we see that um, remnants of that. Uh, mechanism where we see that we get the, the growth of the orthorhombic um, demands in the switching of room temperature. Um, so next thing we looked at was um, the switching, again, related to two different species. And what we find is that um, it's the zirconium centered unit cells which facilitate the switching. So these are the ones we start switching first ahead of the titanium centered. Um, and again, something, we else, something else we looked at was the, the, uh, uh, a neighbor analysis. So we looked at whether it was titanium centered or um, zirconium centered, and then we looked at the number of neighbors it had. So uh, what we found is unit cells which were enclosed by titanium, so in titanium rich clusters, 
is the switch begins to switch slower than those which were in Saturnian rich um, clusters. So this can kind of be explained because the piece of dough that has the anti-parietric um, ground state, so it has these easily activated rotational nodes. Okay, so to conclude this first part, we find that at low temperatures you need to have a large voltage flow of Connie C, so that can sometimes um, give you false results. Um, there's a different switching mechanism at lower room temperature. At low temperature, we've got switching through or from your domains by a nucleation rope mechanism. At room temperature, you've got these fast nucleation small domains, which you call um, We find the switching is facilitated by zirconium rich clusters. And we find a double peak in the polarization distribution at low temperatures. And this is due to titanium centered unit cells being in zirconium um, rich clusters, which um, suppress the parallel for displacements. Um, so then the second part I wanted to talk about was um, atom scheme with aging and paraelectrics. So this is a quick introduction, so we've got the first one this later, so I'm just going to introduce this here, and then we can discuss that later if you come to my place there. Um, so aging is defined as the change in the material's property over time. Um, so Shilu um, kind of introduced this very nicely earlier. Um, so in PZT, um, you get different defect dipoles which exist. So whether you're doping um, to on purpose, or it could be the dopants are introduced through um, fabrication or milling processes, you find that you get these um, defect um, associates um, with oxygen vacancies. So these are thermodyn thermodynamically stable, um, and you also find that they have the lowest energy when they're aligned with the domain. Um, so Ren in his paper um, called this the symmetry conforming principle. Um, so in our model, what we do is we introduce these um, defect di um, dopant defect um, associates, which creates this defect dipart. So we can model the system, I have no defects at all, we can set up in an unaged condition, this is where they're all randomly orientated, or we can set up in an aged condition, where all our defect dipoles are pointing on this, a certain direction, in this case along the x-axis. Um, so one of the large contentions in this at the moment is whether aging is caused by a volume effect, um, by these defect dipoles in the volume of the domain, or whether it's a boundary effect by the migration to the domain wall causing pinning, or um, in interactions with interfaces such as um, electrodes or uh, grain boundaries. Um, so one of the advantages about our model is we can do it in bulk, we can get rid of um, all interfaces entirely, we've got no electrodes, but no domains, uh, no domain walls, um, no grain boundaries. So we can model purely the volumetric effects and have a look to see if we reproduce all the artifacts of aging. And the answer is yes, we do. Um, so the purple case here is our bulk, so this is where we've got no conditions, we get the the well-known square hysteresis. In the NH conditions, this is where we've got the randomly orientated defect dipoles. We find that the coercive field drops a little bit, and that's because you get this drop from the intrinsic coercive field, and it moves closer towards the experimental values. Um, so next thing what happens, what happens if we use a polling field perpendicular or parallel to the aging direction? If you poll perpendicular, this is where you start getting the pinching, and eventually double hysteresis loops, um, which matches the experiment. And that's right here. Um, and if you, per if you pull parallel to the direction you age, you get a shift along the, the x-axis, along the electric field, and this is due to the, um, the asymmetry that you introduce um, in your W potential. Likewise, you also um, can reproduce the large recoverable strain, um, and this comes from aging perpendicular to the, um, the aging direction. So what's happened is the, intrinsic, um, the internal electric field caused by these defect dipoles promotes reorientation of your probe axis parallel to them, so in this case along the x-axis, as we pull perpendicular along the z-direction, eventually the electric field becomes large enough to break that coercive field, reorientate up, and this is what stimulates the um, double hysteresis and the exceptionally large strain. So here it goes up to about 4.5%, and that's because of the CFA ratio of the titanium. So to conclude this, um, this model on aging provides insight into the microscopic mechanism of, um, of aging, um, it reproduces the pinched and double hysteresis, the large recoverable strain, and the asymmetry strain memory. Um, so we've got lots more information. I have the results on my posters. So please feel free to um, have a chat. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge my supervisor and all the collaborators um, and those that can be in. So thank you very much. So do we have time for many questions? Yeah, I'm very much impressed by your work. Uh, it's really, I, see, I can appreciate it's lots of work uh, in simulation analysis and presentation. Thank you.
I only have small uh, wonder at low temperatures in less zircone in, in PZT near the Mercury phase boundary. There is also uh, uh, frozen uh, tilt structure. Uh, the, the structure is um, there is a phase transition, uh, additional phase transition, uh, which goes to R3M on the left side. Mm -hmm. I don't um, see you on. So I um, can't remember entirely if our model does reproduce that. Uh, those intricate